Okay, take 87. I keep on trying to get this done in like 10 minutes, but it keeps on taking 20. So the problem is we want to go to U from UTF-8, or rather from Unicode to something else. So this is a Unicode string. We can tell that because you can see it and it looks like Unicode characters. So if I paste this into my console here, um, that is uh, internally, there's a byte sequence behind it, but what's being displayed is Unicode characters. And the byte sequence behind it is uh, hypothetically UTF-8. Um, and then this is just proof that this Unibabel, which is this library that I, I created, works. You can see it goes from um, UTF-8 to base64. And this is actually a proper encoding. This is the same encoding that if we were to go to node real quick and do new buffer and paste in our lovely buffer. Notice how it thinks it's two characters for a second. Watch this. If we do anything, then it switches and it gets it right. Um, weird, right? Uh, so new buffer dot to, yeah, just dot length, right? Uh, 13 bytes. Um, what was the thing that I wanted to show about that? Oh, two base 64, right? Two string base 64. Oh yeah, there we are. Boom, boom, same, same. Got it? Good. All right, so um, Unibabel can work for you. It's available on Bower. Uh, it's also available down here at the end of this uh, post. And I'm going to try to speed through this and not get hung up on lots of other things. So process buffer is another implementation. It does, um, it's exactly the same as Node in terms of its output. Uh, it may or may not be as performant as something else because he doesn't use type, he doesn't rely on typed arrays. Uh, the good news is that all of these solutions I'm talking about, they work. I mean, I'm pretty sure you can use them all. And I know you can use Unibabel all the way back to Internet Explorer 6 and Android 2.3, which is the new evil guy because nobody's using Internet Explorer 6 anymore. Um, but then you can also mix and match. So Frost's Buffer uses Beat Gamut's Base64. You could also use Mozilla's String View to get Base64 if that was important to you. Or you can use what's available in the DOM, not in JavaScript, but in the DOM A to B, B to A. Um, and then if you need to be going between Unicode and a typed array as UTF-8, um, you can use text encoder is native in the browser. So I can do new text encoder utf encode. Um, boom, I get my byte sequence there, um, which is the same as if I do unibabel.utf8 to buffer same byte sequence <clears throat> would be the same if I used Frost's buffer. Anyway, um, text encoder is only available in Chrome and Firefox. Text encoding is a polyfill. It does more than just UTF-8 and UTF-16 ASCII. It does also like Japanese and Big Five Chinese and all the ISO standards and all that. So it's kind of big. That's the downside to it. I made a fork of it, which is in this light branch on text encoder light that's based off of the same text encoding, but I threw out everything except for UTF-8. I could probably put back in UTF-16 if somebody really needed it. And then the master branch is actually based off of Feroz's buffer. It's just the implementation that he uses and I pull it out with none of the other stuff that he uses. So those are some options for you. Um, and I couldn't tell you which is the most performant because I tried to do some tests on JSPerf and it turns out that um, there are problems with uh, the database that he's using and so it doesn't properly encode multi-byte Unicode characters. And so when, yeah, I just, so I couldn't do the test is the end result. I could probably do it if I didn't use four byte characters if I only used uh, two and three byte characters. So one byte, two byte, three byte, four byte. That's what, oh. Yeah, here's a whole table of examples of characters by byte. Anyway, so moving right along. Um, the reason that it's important to be able to do this is that we want predictable output. Why do we want predictable output? Um, because you might want to do something like secure remote password, where essentially uh, the simplest solution would be that you take a SHA-1 sum of some salt that's specific to an application. It would be the same salt in your Android app, in your iOS app, in your web app and then you add in the user's password, you run the SHA sum and it produces this SHA sum that is now a proof of the secret. So you don't have to send the user's username and password to your server. You send the username and the proof of secret to the server and you treat the proof of secret exactly the way that you treat um, a password, except that the server never has to have the password and the best way to keep a secret is not to know it, right? Um, 
Now the problem with this is that you need the same encoding every time. So there are improper encodings. And let's talk about some of the delicate issues here. So here we see, I didn't realize, this is some Google search I was doing about uh, SRP, or was it, no, proof of secret, right? And so this page gives the character encoding for ASCII, but it has a Unicode smart quote, smart quote in there. But because they didn't uh, provide the metadata to tell which character set was being used, which is UTF-8, it instead got encoded as 0xffd, which is this unknown encoding character. So if we want to see this in the browser, I can take um, my, uh, let's see, I can go from UT8 to buffer. Instead, I'm going to do UTF-8 to binary string. Now note that this binary string has the exact same byte sequence as the UTF-8. So if I say binary string to buffer, and I use that binary string. Now notice, I can actually copy and paste in the console. If I save this to a file and then loaded it in JavaScript, this wouldn't work because the bytes would get deleted. But for some reason, it happens to work in the console. You can see if I go over here and I paste, nope, not that, uh, get out of that. And blar. You can see that there's these unprintable characters that happen to be copied when I'm copying and pasting. But if I save this file and load it in JavaScript, those will get deleted, then I get a different byte sequence. So this is important stuff. Anyway, I have the same byte sequence for the string that's binary and the string that's UTF-8. The only difference is that there's some internal metadata specifying um, this is Unicode. This is a UTF-8 encoded Unicode string versus this one doesn't have any encoding information. So it produces ASCII. Um, and if I were to take some string that happened to not have a valid character in it. Uh, so uh, when the user's typing, I'm assuming that they're typing from their keyboard, they're giving me valid characters from their operating system. But let's just think for one second that perhaps um, the user, uh, or, or somehow I'm getting an invalid sequence of bytes. Uh, Unibabel is going to be dumb and it's going to preserve those bytes. So if you do unibabel.utf8 to buffer and you give it an invalid uh, Unicode string, and then you do the inverse, you say buffer to UTF-8, you should get back the same string in both cases. Um, I'm not exactly super clear on the best way to go about creating invalid Unicode characters. But anyway, if I had an invalid byte sequence, in theory, I would get the same invalid byte sequence back with Unibabel. Whereas with Feras, or the more proper encodings, it would replace any um, invalid byte sequence with a definite byte sequ sequence, which is UXFFFD. Now this is good because if we're doing something like a SHA sum or a, uh, you know, any operation where we need predictable output, it's best if it works across, you know, Ruby and Python and everything all the same. Um, so for example, here's an implementation of, that properly encodes Unicode, um, that uh, Mozilla gives in their Base64 encoding example, but it actually gives the wrong binary data. Um, so it's a proper encoding that this function produces, and I need to go up here and click the edit button and, and give them the right one, but it's not the right byte sequence. So I would love to show you the demo, except that I actually don't really want to, but just trust me when I say that if I run this code for converting the um, Unicode sequence, uh, I actually get the wrong uh, byte sequence at the end of it, so I would not be able to use Web Crypto or take the same code and port it to Ruby or Python or whatever, because if I use their encoding system, it's going to produce this uh, byte encoding rather than that byte encoding. And that's an important distinction. And, doo -doo 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 -doo. oh, and of course, I also wanted to show just really quickly, let's see, what do we have with time here? Nine minutes, oh, sweet. So I almost made it in 10, but not quite. So I also want to show here that if we take a look at this um, and, and try our like naive approach instead of you know trying to use something fancy um, of converting, you can see that there are clearly seven characters here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's clearly reporting that there are eight characters, which is absolutely wrong. And that's not even the number of bytes, because if we look at the number of bytes that we have right here, it turns out the number of bytes is 13. So 
when you're doing stuff like calling split on this, like, cause obviously, you know, you want to split it and then you want to for each over it. And then, you know, you can more simply without all this blah, 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 fancy crap, you could just turn it into a buffer that way, right? Wrong. Because first of all, it's going to split by character, not by byte. And then for some characters, it's going to just, I don't know what happened here. I, I'd, I'd actually like to know what is at position seven there. Do we get anything? Do we have like a, uh, let's see, char code at, I don't even know. Okay, cool. So we have this thing that doesn't get represented. I wonder what happens if I just copy and paste that over into my little fun buffer here. Ah, huh, nice, huh. weird, right? Anyway, um, so that's obviously bad. And then if we try to examine uh, what we get there is number three, no, zero, one, two. So number two. So we get that, right? But if we do char code, this will probably actually work in this case. Let's see if it does or not. Ha. Hmm, nope. Yeah, so so we don't get, oh, is that half? Let's just go, let's see. Just, just for funsies, let's go to five here. Okay, definitely wrong. The heart symbol is definitely not char code 32. So if we do, string dot from char code and then we give it 32 um, let me go back to that we get something but it's definitely not a heart right so you can't use the naive approach you have to use either um, you know native where it's available in node or in chrome or you need to use one of these polyfills unibabel uses the dom so that wouldn't work in a non DOM environment. Um, Frost's buffer does not use the DOM, I don't believe. Um, and I don't think the text encoding does either. Anyway, those are your options. It's a little confusing, but again, uh, simplest solution, probably Unibabel, probably will work fine. Um, very robust solution, Frost's buffer, mix and match. If you need base64, use Big Gamut's base64 or Mozilla String View if you want even more options. Um, if you need lots of character encoding help, use the text encoding polyfill. Um, otherwise, you can use, I've taken both Frost's and the text encoding guy's versions and split them into those two branches. So there's the master branch, which is Frost's version, and the white branch, which is um, the text encoding version, depending on what your needs are. All right, so hopefully that helps. Bye. So just a quick rant. This is why ES6 bugs the living daylights out of me, because we have real problems that exist in JavaScript, the language, that need to be solved everywhere, not just solved differently in Node, and then solved differently in Chrome, and then maybe differently in Internet Explorer, and then maybe differently in Mozilla's example that they give on their MDN, right? We need like an actual solution that's part of the language because we have typed arrays and we have Unicode and we need to be able to convert between the two and that needs to be part of the language. But instead in ES6 they're focusing all the syntax sugar and crap and we're never going to have another version of JavaScript that people actually use because there's all this babble and coffee script and all these other things that are compiling it for all the people that want those kind of features. So the kind of people that want those kind of features are never going to be using JavaScript again anyway. They're are always going to be using a compiler and they're never going to rely on the actual language again. So all we're doing is proliferating this problem where build steps become more complicated and we're not solving the problems for people that are actually using the actual language JavaScript. Gar! If this was useful for you, please go ahead and give that little thumbs up button a nice click. Also, you'll see the notes are in the comments section down below. You can either at the end of the article or right up at the top, give it a like, tweet, plus one, whatever. Thanks.